Welcome to everyone joining us for another great Action for Happiness event. Delighted to see so many hundreds of you with us again from all around the world. Thank you for being here. And particularly thank you, Antonio Neves, for being with us this evening. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a joy to join you. Uh, I can't wait for our conversation. Big fan of your work. Antonio, as many of you will know, is a, an author, an inspiring speaker, just generally all around helpful human being who has lots to share with us around how we can, as the title of today's event suggests, stop living on autopilot and start living a little bit more consciously and uh, sort of taking control of, of the things we can control in our lives. And as always, as well as the conversation that Antonio and I will have together, you will have a chance to be involved. He's got some exciting interactive things lined up for us in terms of ways you can participate on the chat. Let's keep it friendly and kind as you always do. And there's also the chance to ask some questions. So please do use the Q&A function and uh, we'll come to at least some of those questions uh, towards the end of today's event. And if you like another question, then please use the upvote feature so we can get the most popular questions answered. But we're just going to dive straight into this. Antonio, thanks for being here. And I would love, because uh, I think you've got a really inspiring backstory, I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, what's got you to where you are today and why this is a topic that's so sort of relevant for you. Yeah, first and foremost, what a joy and honor it is to join everyone here today. It's really fun looking at the chat right now seeing folks joining from all across the world. That's super exciting. Uh, just briefly, if you do a Google search on the internet, it will tell you that I'm the author of Stop Living on Autopilot. It will tell you that I'm a speaker. I speak over 50 times a year at major corporations across the globe. And it will tell you that I'm a success coach. Uh, my background prior to that was over 10 years in New York City as a reporter and television correspondent for some major television networks. Uh, all that stuff is cool, but the internet tells one story, doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, I'm also, most importantly today, I'm Gigi's husband and I'm August and I'm Harper's dad. That, that's what means the most to me. And just, just briefly for people watching, a fun question is, if you had to introduce yourself to a stranger without referencing your career, how would you introduce yourself? That creates connectivity in, in my book. Uh, but to the point of our talk today, uh, five years ago, if you did a Google search on me, a lot of those things existed. You know, I'm the guy with the verified check marks on social media, speaking internationally to a lot of companies, was married, had newborn twins, um, had the white, the house with the white picket fence. I was living what they call the American dream here in the United States. And I don't want to make anyone jealous, but I also was driving a very sexy Honda Odyssey minivan. So I just don't want anyone to get jealous there. Um, but what's interesting about the internet, again, it tells a story, it doesn't tell the whole story because I was outwardly successful. But behind the scenes, life was straight up a hot mess. I was struggling in my career. I was phoning it on, in on stages to over 3,000 people. My wife and I were deep, and I mean deep, in marital counseling. We got fired by multiple counselors. I was struggling to connect with my newborn twins. I gained 30 pounds of weight, and, and I grew this big beard to hide the weight gain. Uh, just so you know, beards typically do not actually hide weight gain. Um, I spent my evenings uh, probably drinking one too many drinks in that evening time. Uh, this was a time that my father was diagnosed with dementia. Um, and I actually picked up a very bad habit during this time. I became a secret cigarette smoker. And one day when things began to change, when I was struggling during this time and, and living on autopilot, and we'll talk more about what that looks like a little bit later, I'm guessing, I was smoking a cigarette in an alley in Santa Monica, California, where I live. And what I perceived to be a homeless man came up to me and he asked if he could borrow a cigarette. He looked like he had seen many better days. I gave him a cigarette. We started talking like cigarette smokers do. And at one point he noticed that I was wearing a bright green gardening glove on my hand. And he's like, what's up with the gardening glove? And I said, oh, my, my wife doesn't know that I smoke. In that moment, he looked at me like I committed a crime because I was wearing this glove so my wife wouldn't smell the stench of the smoke. And he said some words to me that I will never forget. He said, you have to figure that out. Hey man, you got to figure that out. And you can probably figure out what the expletive was in there. And five years ago, that was the moment for me, Mark, that I realized that I was living on autopilot. There were some key things that I needed to do to, to course correct and, and take back control 
of my life. Antonio, thank you for sharing that. I always find it really moving to hear people sort of taking off the mask of it and sharing the kind of gritty reality that so many of us are dealing with in our lives and the disconnect sometimes between the persona and, and the reality. Um, and I think this does bridge really nicely into your theme of autopilot, which is obviously the topic of your book, but also what we've decided to focus on um, you know, in our time together. So I'd love it if you could maybe frame a little bit about what you mean by living on autopilot and why so many of us get stuck in this way of being. Well, first and foremost, society encourages autopilot in many ways. Um, you know, we, we check off these boxes in society, but very rarely do we ask ourselves, do we want some of these things? We can talk about getting an education and we can talk about getting married and we can talk about getting a mortgage for our home. We can talk about getting that good job everybody talks about. We just check these boxes off, but very rarely do we, we hit pause. Um, but for these people, for folks who are watching right now, a, a cool metric to identify if maybe you are on autopilot right now is just to think back to the last 30 days. I say the last 30 days and I talk about this in the book because it's very accessible. And for those folks who happen to be employed right now, I know a lot of people have lost their jobs over the course of the 18 plus months. But for people who happen to be employed right now, I want you to ask yourself a simple yet challenging question. If your boss, if your manager had to make a decision to rehire you based on the last 30 days at work, would they immediately say yes or would there be some hesitation? If there's some hesitation, odds are you may be on autopilot at work. Just to get personal for a quick second, if you, I invite people to buckle up for this next question. If you happen to be in a relationship, you're married, you have a spouse, significant other, based on the last 30 days of that relationship, if that person had to make a decision to recommit to you or not, would they immediately say yes or would they say hold up? Based on the last 30 days, I don't know. With the last 30 days as well, we can look at our parenting. You know, when our kids say our phone has been between us and them far too much. Have we said, give me five minutes too many times? We can look at the last 30 days with our health. We can look at the last 30 days with our fitness. We can look at the last 30 days with our personal finances. And just briefly, just to dig in, just to give you a juxtaposition, as we think about our career, what I want people to think about is, when they first were interviewing for the job that they're in right now and how fired up, how excited they were to get this job. Think about the second job interview. Think about when you got the third one and think about the day you found out you got the job and how excited you were. Think about how you showed up on day one, week one, month one. The question begs right now is, are you still bringing that day one energy that you once brought to that job? Are you still bringing that day one energy to that marriage, to that relationship that you said you wanted so bad, that day one energy to being a parent as well? And, and just briefly, I have to say, if you don't like the answers to these questions, I don't want you to beat yourself up. This is all just data. This is all just um, experiences that we can learn from so we can make new decisions moving forward in our life. Life. Well, I... I, I was going to say I love that, but I find that personally quite challenging. I thought I was doing quite well when he talked about the job. I'm very blessed to do a job that I, you know, I, I feel potentially can help people and is a motivator. But actually, when it comes to relationships, I recognize that I take people I love for granted. I'm not maybe bringing that day one, week one energy. So I think, you know, you're helping me realize I may be living bits of my life on autopilot. And I suspect of the, you know, thousand plus people here live right now, many will have felt that way. So I'd love us to maybe think about, uh, you know, a, a practical response to that. And I, you said a lovely question to me the other day when we spoke, Antonio, about one way we could think about what we might do in this situation. Do you want to share that with the audience now? Yeah, it, before we get to that, I think you mentioned something really, really important about uh, our relationships, our personal relationships, because what's interesting, I'll never forget. Uh, I'll never forget years ago, I was dating someone. This is when I was working in the television industry in New York City. And we went out for this amazing gala and event. I remember coming back from that event. And we had a great time, what I thought was a great time. And I remember the woman that I was dating at the time said something so kind and gentle to me, but it was so real. And she said, I wish that you could give me half the attention that you give to strangers. Think about that for a quick second. I wish that you could give me half the attention, half the energy that you give to strangers because we get so comfortable giving our best to everyone else. 
But unfortunately, going back to autopilot, the people at home, the people in our day-to-day -day life, they, what do they get? They get our leftovers, right? And so we, so it's so crazy how we can feel so comfortable giving our least to the people that matter most. Sometimes when I'm driving home, I have to park my car a block away from home before I come in to get myself centered, to show up with energy to show up with joy, to show up with enthusiasm, to make sure my wife and kids get the same thing. I just gave those 3000 people on stage in Atlanta or Dallas or, or somewhere else. So I think that's really important to think about. And to get back to that interesting question that we can think about for ourselves, uh, here's the, what have you stopped doing that got you to where you are today? What a fascinating question. You know, Mark, we had a conversation not long ago and we were talking about sports. And there's, inter there's this interesting thing that happens in sports. If you happen to be um, a football fan in the UK or we call it soccer here in the United States, we all have watched that game before where our team is just kicking butt in the first half. It's halftime. And what do you say? I say a team like Aston Villa is up three to zero at halftime. But we know what happens all of a sudden it's in the 93rd minute in stoppage time and all of a sudden it's three to three and the opposing team is on the attack. What happened? What happened is in the first half, the a team came out playing to win. In the second half, the team came out playing not to lose. Those are two completely different approaches to life. So a question we can ask all of ourselves right now is, are we still playing to win in this thing called life, in our careers, in our relationships as parents, et cetera, or are we holding on tight, playing not to lose? And a fun question I like to ask people, and listen, I'm a coach. I, I coach uh, mid-career professionals. Those folks who are nowhere near the beginning of their career and nowhere near the, the end, in the middle. And the question I ask them is I, I like to separate themselves from the situation. And that is, if your life was a movie, what would the lead character start doing to turn things around? What's beautiful about that question is we can remove ourselves from that situation. And you know what it's like, Mark, you're talking to a friend, we can give our friend, our spouse, someone else great advice. It is so challenging to give ourselves that exact same advice when we separate ourselves and say, if I'm that lead character, I'm the protagonist, what would they do in the movie to turn things around? We all know one thing, not 10 things, we all know one thing that we can do to turn things around in our career. Maybe arrive a little bit early, maybe take action on some ideas, maybe build some relationships. If you're in a relationship, you know one thing that you can do to be a better partner today, one thing parenting, fitness, personal finances, et cetera. So, so I'm, let's, I'm gonna challenge let's do people this to right think now. about let's, let's do this right now. So wherever you are around the world, let's really bring to mind this idea. If your life was a movie and the lead character had to turn it around, what would they start doing? So I'd invite you all to share, again, if you'd like to, something in the chat that you think, you know, that, that movie character might do in your context. And we'll just share a few of the things that come up. So please feel free to share. So start exercising, be in the moment, feel my feet, be kinder, change my attitude, take up boxing, get rid of my phone, accept things, go to the gym, get therapy, stretch, uh, spend more time with my daughter, start doing things differently, self-compassion, rest, take more risks, be more visible, cut down on sugar, enter a marathon, breathe, apply for a job, piano lessons, love myself. I'm getting overwhelmed by the number coming now, but how are you feeling as you see that list? Uh, frankly, I'm being emotional as I see it, because the truth is we get so stuck in our ways. We get so stuck in social media. We get so stuck in watching television shows that say, are you still watching? Like technology is asking us. We've been watching for so, so long. Are you still watching that? When I see all of these things come up so quick, so quick, they type it in. We all know what that next step is, right? It's not work out the next seven days in a row, but maybe you can work out today. Take that piano lesson today, block off 10 minutes to spend time with your daughter. Like we all know what that one thing is. And guess what, Mark, what I love about this, none of this requires moving to a new city. None of this requires quitting our job. None of this requires making more money. These are things that we have direct control over in this moment. 
Yeah, well said. And I think that that sense of agency is really important. So it feels to me that this is linked to a word and a phrase that many in this community uh, embrace or use in some way of, of mindfulness, you know, sort of if autopilot is sort of living a bit in zombie mode, you know, unconsciously, mindfulness is trying to bring a bit more kind of awareness to how we're feeling, what we're doing, our choices. Is, is that kind of really what you're saying, which is be more present and therefore make sort of more conscious choices? I'm saying a couple of things, 100% be present, be in the moment, be aware. I found that unfortunately many of us, and I'll put myself in that category, can be so painfully aware, unaware. Uh, but also what we're talking about is in society, what we do so good nowadays is just we point our fingers everywhere else. And we're so good at getting mad right now at politicians, at governments, at teachers, at managers, at, we can just point our finger at everyone. But this book, and this book, let's be clear, Stop Living on Autopilot, it's some tough love. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a real conversation with a friend who loves you and cares enough about you to tell you the truth. And what it's inviting all of us to do is to stop pointing the finger out there and be willing to point the finger right here. And to remind ourselves something that at, at one point I forgot is that I have a say in this, is that I have a say in this thing called my life. And more than anything, what I'm imploring people to do is not just remember that they have a say in this, but to be willing to make a decision. If something isn't happening right now, Mark, there, there are so many people who have been figuring things out for a long time. I, I, people, I'm gonna, I, I lovingly invite you to stop figuring things out and to make a decision. I'm a firm believer that figuring things out is ruining so many people's lives because that means that we're, we're not making a decision. And to be clear, not making a decision is indeed making a decision. So call that mindfulness, I, I think it is, but it's also taking personal accountability and responsibility for those things in our purview that we can control. I really like this message because it fits with the action for happiness ethos. We're not talking for happiness or thinking for happiness so much as action. You know, it's, it begins with doing something. So you can know all the theory of positive psychology. You can have all the greatest intentions, but unless you actually take that first small step, then you don't you don't move uh, in in the direction you want to head in. Um, how does this relate to our our values and what matters to us in life and what we stand for? Because again, part of the reason people point the finger is that we see things around us that we wish were different and we can't necessarily change the world, but we can, as you've said, choose how we respond. How does this relate to the things we stand for? Yeah, a good friend of mine says something, the author Bassam Tarazi once said, don't change the world, change the moment. Think about that juxtaposition right there. Don't change the world, change the moment. You know, we all have been blessed with these amazing emotions that we feel, right? Especially in society the past 18 plus months. Holy smokes, have we been on a roller coaster of emotions? You know, we felt a lot of anger. We felt a lot of sadness. We felt a lot of fear. For some people, they've actually felt, felt a lot of joy, but they didn't want to let it out because they, they felt guilty of uh, being joyful when so many people are going through challenging times. Uh, but what I'm going to invite people to do is to be aware of these, this roller coaster of emotions that we're feeling. And one thing I try to do and something I always invite my clients to do is be, be leery of making decisions when you're too high or you're, you're, you're too low, when you're angry, when you're mad, when you're sad, etc. One thing I always like to revert to during good times and bad times is my own personal standards, is my own personal values. I think a lot of us have forgot during these past you know, 18 plus months what we stand for. I'm going to challenge, lovingly challenging everyone right now just to think about those things internally that you stand for. Those, if nothing else, those three tenets that are critically important to you. And as you make decisions in your life moving forward, even you know, right now in the United States, we're about to have a Thanksgiving this week which means there are gonna be a lot of arguments and a lot of disagreements about politics and a whole bunch of other things over dinner on Thursday here in the States. But I invite people to think about your standards and your values before you respond to see what kind of message you do want to share and you don't wanna share based on solely reacting on your emotions. When I react based on emotion, 
I can tell you typically things don't go that well. <laughs> yeah, very wise. Um, and of course, we're all on our own unique journey. It's a personal thing. And we, as you say, we have our own underlying values and things we stand for. But we're also a social species and we kind of rely on each other. And you've already talked beautifully about your own relationships with your spouse and children and so on. Um, you know, to what extent is this about carving out a journey alone and or to what extent is this better done you know in collaboration and in connection with others yeah i'm a firm believer that no one who has accomplished anything of significance has done it alone and neither should you we should not do this alone you know even prior you know to what you know what's been classified as a pandemic you know the cdc said there was an epidemic of loneliness of people spending so much time alone, of isolation. And unfortunately, the research shows the older we get, the more isolated that we become. So I'm gonna encourage everyone not to do this alone and to identify what I call your allies of glory. These are those people that encourage you, that inspire you, that challenge you, that push you and hold you accountable to be the absolute best version of yourself. You can find these can be family members, they can be colleagues, people in your community, people at church, uh, people in local organizations, you name it, group coaching programs. You know, and one of the biggest things I hear when I, when I say, hey, find your allies of glory, most people will say, I, I hear you, Antonio, but I don't have these people in my life. Well, let me be clear, these allies, they don't have to be people you kick it with and hang out with every single day. These are just people who are in your corner. And if you don't have allies right now and you don't think you do, I challenge you to go to the chat right now and see all the conversation that's happening right now. Those folks in there, I promise you, they are your allies. And if you seek out support on social media in those Facebook groups and beyond, you will get encouragement. And it can come from people you don't even know. Uh, just briefly, for the past five plus years, around the time I was living on, on autopilot, one thing I started doing is there's this thing we, I do here called Man Morning. Every Thursday at 7 a.m., I meet with a group of guys and we spend an hour together. We go for a hike or a walk or we get coffee. And we talk about business, life, relationships, you name it. We love each other. We challenge one another. But that's been a game changer for me, having that on the calendar. And what's key is that that's opt out. Like we expect you to be there if you're in town, you opt out, you don't opt in. So there's never, are we doing it this week? And no, it's a standing event on the calendar. And I'll just say meeting with friends at 7 a.m. for a cup of coffee or tea is very different than meeting with friends at 7 p.m. for a cocktail or a lager. The conversations are completely different, more inspiring, more encouraging, more hopeful at 7 a.m. <laughs> than they are, at least in my experience, at 7 p.m. I love that. And I'm also really grateful that you drew that analogy to the community chat here. I mean, I, I'm always blown away by the way people support each other in these events. And actually, some of you are already heavily involved, but others may not be aware. We have an Action for Happiness app, which has about 200,000 active users now and every day there's action ideas and inspiring suggestions and the support the kindness the compassion in that community inspires me literally daily and it, it in many ways it's the opposite of the toxicity we often see on social media where people are genuinely looking out for each other in this community so I, I agree with you when you when you get yourself in the right places and you reach out and are willing to ask for help it's very often there but I wanted to also come back to something you touched on which is people have been going through some really dark times recently in personal challenges and loss and uncertainty, financial difficulties, mental health challenges. All of what you've described is really you know, inspiring about kind of taking control of our lives. But for some people, it's just really hard getting out of bed in the mornings, finding any energy in those difficult situations. You know, and yet sometimes those darkest times are the times that help us, you know, have a sort of life changing revelation. Mm -hmm. What what do you what's your reflection on how we can act on these ideas even when life is really really tough yeah first i feel energy i just want to send out love for everyone that is going through those challenging times right now we read a lot about how some places things are getting better people say some things are getting worse but i know some people right now are going through some challenging times and one thing i want to encourage you to do as i just mentioned is not to go about this alone and not to be uh isolated uh, if you're not willing to get out and engage with people one-on-one, -on -one, of course, we can do that virtually. We can do that in the app, as you mentioned. 
if you don't know what your next step is, one thing I'm gonna encourage you to do is to be willing to help someone else, uh, be of service to someone else in your community or beyond. One thing I found over the course of my life, especially during my challenging times, when I feel stuck, when I don't know what to do next, you know, those are the times typically I think really hard. Very rarely, by the way, I've ever solved a problem by thinking really hard. Those are during the times that I'm figuring things out. But one thing I've found that if we're of service to others, personal breakthroughs can come for ourselves as well, whether that's volunteering or giving our time. Again, breakthroughs can happen when we're helping someone else. Uh, when I do this, this man morning that I mentioned, when I participate in my own like masterminds or group coaching events, there are times that I don't even say a word over the course of an hour, but I still get so much out of that experience. So again, I would encourage that person not to isolate. I would encourage that person to find a community and maybe to find something that they can do to, to build some momentum in their life. You talked about positive psychology earlier. And one of the key components of that is, is ongoing regular achievement. And I think as we regularly achieve something, it can be super, super small, by the way, 10 minute workout today, writing 200 words in a journal today, you name it, what that creates is ongoing momentum uh, for the next day. And it will work like compound interest and, and where we can be in 30 days is a drastically different place. So that's, that's great. And, I, and it reminds me of, I heard you talking about your own personal top five you know little little kind of tiny accomplishments that can turn a day into a better day do you want to share maybe some of your personal actions that really help yeah I'm really big on collecting data like and I want to invite everyone when you're having a great day I want you to pay attention to what's going on and if you're also if you're having a bad day I want you to pay attention to what's going on as I've tracked data over the course of my life I found that typically when I'm having a good day even maybe a great day five things have happened I have sweat, I've got a workout in. I have educated myself. Maybe that's listening to a, a podcast or reading 10 pages of a book. I have connected with a friend. I have meditated, sometimes as, as little as, as 10 minutes. And this is a key one right here, I have finished something. Sometimes finishing something can be a blog post, it could be uh, finishing writing my, my thousand words for the day towards my next book, et cetera. So I figured out, for example, what my top five are. And the cool thing is when I those five things happen on a daily basis, it's very rare that I have a really, really low and bad day. It doesn't mean that I have a great day, but it kind of keeps those low days away. And sometimes I can get those five things done even before eight or 9 a.m., which is a, a big victory for me. So I invite folks to think about what are those three or five things that they can do on a daily basis that will activate them in a positive way. I really love that. I'm very grateful, very practical list. And I think it's, um, yeah, it reminds, it reminds me, there are sometimes things we can do that combine more than one of these things together. I'm reminded that we've booked to do a, a Santa Claus fun run with my wife and the kids and a bunch of friends in a couple of weekends time when we are doing exercise, we're raising money for a charity, we're connecting with others, we're being in nature. Like it's, that's those kind of things that can hit off multiple little mini moments of connection and, and, and wellness together is really powerful. Um, and and I, lo I love your list. Uh, I'm, oh, and someone's kindly shared it on the chat. So that was exercise, educate yourself, connect, meditate, finish something. A personal insight I've had with this is that I'm, I'm a to-do list person and I used to like tick off all my work tasks and I started adding some of these things to my list. It was like, I can't actually achieve my day unless I've done the little bit of meditation or the being grateful and so on. And actually changed me into more like a to-be list than a to-do list. So I found that really, really helpful. But I'd love it if we could maybe invite the audience to share like their, some of their top exercises. So Antonio shared his top five. What's one of your top actions that really helps, you know, you turn a, to a normal day into a better day, however small it might be. Let's see some of these then. Walking to music, smiling, working out, food, making art, being grateful, being walking the dog, quiet time, uh, a cuddle, uh, I can't even see them, they're going past so fast, reading, journaling, meditating, laughing, talking Italian, uh, yoga, being with a colleague, dancing, stretching, playing piano, hug, mindfulness, uh, gin, <laughs> yoga, 
organizing my desk, helping someone, making someone else smile, playing with my kids. Again, this is bringing a big smile to my face, just seeing this list. It's doing the same for me. And I just love that everyone has different things that they do. My five can be very different than someone else's. Maybe you have three instead of five. So find out what works for you and, and test it. And sometimes less is actually more. And if you can get it done even earlier in the day, that's incredible. I, I love that so many people have, have mentioned, mentioned nature. And the reason why I love that people have mentioned get, getting time out of nature, an assignment I always give to my coaching clients that they always resist. So I tell them they have to go for a 30 minute walk in nature without technology. No podcast, no phone, no notifications. And people typically resist. I'm talking about just 30 minutes. But let me tell you, after those 30 minutes in nature with no technology, people come back and they will say, I feel refreshed. I feel like a new person. That problem I was trying to solve, I figured it out. Some people say, man, I just started crying out of nowhere. Or I started having this ridiculous laughter. We have such a backlog of emotions that haven't got out and we need to create silence. We need to create space for them to come out so we can feel everything that we need to feel. So I'm really fired up seeing folks say that they like to get out in nature. Yeah, so am I. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna to come to questions from the audience. So if you haven't had a chance to put one in the Q&A, please feel free. Or if you see one you like, please vote on it and get it up the list. But before we do that, there's something you said to me recently and I've seen you talk about before, which really struck a chord with me. And it, it made me think of the phrase about something about waking up. And I feel that in this weird pandemic time, to some extent, what it's reminded us is to sort of wake up to what really matters in life. We get so caught up in the, the stuff that doesn't matter so much. But you said, don't wait for a life altering event until you live the life you want to live. I'd love it if you could say a bit more about what you mean with that. Sure. Back in 2019, I'm a guy that travels well over 100,000 miles during a standard year for speaking. Back in 2019, I was on a flight in the United States and I fly a lot, but this is one of those flights where I knew something was wrong. Uh, we were delayed for five hours due to maintenance delays prior to that. And then when we got in the air, I knew something was wrong because I thought I smelled smoke in the air. And my metric for wondering if a flight's going good or bad is I always look at the flight attendant. They tell me if things are okay or bad. This day, when I saw panic in the eyes of the flight attendant on the small plane, I was like, oh, this isn't good. I saw her reach for a manual to give instructions about how to land and brace yourself. And then I heard the pilot say, we're going to attempt an emergency landing. Uh, anytime the word attempt precedes landing, I'm a little bit concerned. And at that moment, I knew I had two things to do. I knew I had to send two text messages, SMS, whatever you want to call it. There were no bars on my phone, but I first typed one up to my mom and it said, hey, mom, I want you to know that I love you and you know, tell my brother and sister that I love them as well. And then I opened up another text and to my wife and I just said, uh, flight's not going as planned. Uh, I love you. I love our kids. Please let them know to live a life of joy, of discipline, of jack, of action, and a few other things. And I said, I love you. And then uh, the flight got low enough that we got the bars and I pressed send on both of those messages. And I just remember taking a really deep sigh and just said, holy smokes, ain't this some, and you can probably figure out what that word is, uh, breaking news. I landed, I'm here, I'm talking to you. We landed safely, though we were surrounded by emergency vehicles. And it hit me in that moment to uh, not wait for a life altering event to live the life that we're supposed to live. So many of us know about the person that gets a bad health diagnosis. We know about that person that gets served divorce papers. We know about that person that gets fired from their job. We know about that person that gets pulled over by the police and they get a, a driving while intoxicated ticket. I can give you countless examples. And it's only then that people tend to make a change after that life altering event. What I'm gonna implore everyone to do right now is not to wait for that bad health diagnosis, not to wait for that bad news from your spouse, not to wait till you get pulled over. I wanna encourage you to know that you are the life altering event that you've been waiting for. For so long, we're always looking for that event out there, out there. And I get emotional as I think about this because we are that. And somehow we have forgot that. That from the day that we were born, we were verified by the divine, by our God, whatever you want to call it, 
but sometimes we're walking around living this life like we are a secondary character in our own life. We are the lead character. You have a say in this. So I just challenge everyone not to wait for that life altering event. Make a decision today. Make another decision tomorrow. Create that momentum to see what can happen. Uh, I'm a firm believer that our success and our happiness hurts absolutely no one. And I want to see all of us shine. Um, I didn't plan on going there, Mark, but there, there you go. <laughs> Antonio, I'm, I've got shivers down my spine and feeling very emotional from what you just shared. I could see the emotion in your yeah. eyes as you shared that story. That's, um, yeah. yeah, one of the most powerful things anyone's ever shared in one of these conversations. And I'm really grateful yeah. that you, you brought that. Thank you. And yeah, yeah I, nothing to add other than let's let's try to make those decisions. But it actually brings me to the first question I wanted to put to you from Nelle uh, this evening. How do we actually make the decision? In the beginning, you said that the homeless man told you to figure things out and then went on to state that figuring things out, you know, is, in your opinion, kind of ruining things. So so um, what are we actually to do? Do we listen to our intuition or to something else? That's the question. Uh I mentioned the homeless man up there. What I didn't mention to you is because of my poor eating habits, because of some other things, I, I found myself in the emergency room multiple times, getting cardiac MRIs and, and having some challenges. Thank goodness everything was okay, but I kind of did have a life altering event. Uh, and Nelly, I don't want that to be the case for you. Uh, I wanna invite you just to ask yourself, what is one small decision you can make today in that area that you have a concern in, in your life? And again, what's that small thing? And if you don't know the answer to that question, because many of us have been paralyzed for so long and haven't made decisions, I invite you to talk to a friend and maybe get their suggestion, get their support. Or even better, going back to that, that kind of external type of question, Nelly, if someone was in your exact same shoes, if someone was in your exact same shoes, what would you invite them to do? My hunch is you know exactly what is a, a, the small decision that you can make today to start to turn things around. And maybe if you look at it externally as someone else, what you would tell them to do, it would be easier for you to identify what that is. I was once asked by a coach um, to think about what advice my future self would give me right now about you know what to do more, what to do less of. And I found it, again, like you said, like surprising clarity. And what I said to myself was something along the lines of, spend more time doing the things you really care about with people you really love. I mean, it was as simple as that. And at the time I was doing the opposite of that. So that was a kind of yeah. like, whoa, this is all wrong. Um, Walter has a really interesting question. You've talked a lot about careers and jobs and directions in our working lives. The question here is what if you're retired? That's a really great question. Uh, if you're retired, I invite you still to figure out what are some of those key things you do every single day that, that activate you. You may not need that income anymore from that nine to five like you once did, but that doesn't mean that you're done. I invite you to figure out what those hobbies are or what those activities are, who those people are. Uh, unfortunately, something that happens when so many people retire is that they end up isolating themselves in their life. Uh, they no longer have connection with the groups. So I invite you to find some organizations, group coaching programs, local organizations in their community, whether they meet in person or virtually. You have opportunities to volunteer. Um, another thing I'll challenge you to do, I love this right here, and I always invite people, a, a question I ask in the book and I invite people regularly, regularly is to ask yourself, when is the last time you finished something? Like, when is the last time you finished something? It could be a home improvement project. It could be a recipe you made from beginning to end. It could be booking that trip, that tab that's been open on your computer for a really, really long time, which never hit buy yet. You know, unfortunately, you know, in society nowadays, people are, are quote unquote crazy busy. And it's because we have so many apps open in our life, kind of like a computer. And as people probably know, if you have a lot of apps open on your computer at the same time, what happens? We start to slow down. The RAM is taking up, right? So I invite people to close all of those non-essential apps and only keep open the essential apps and regularly finish things. Uh, so overall, what I would say, if you're retired, is find that community, finish something, uh, and, and continue to connect. That, that's a tough one, but I, I, I feel for folks who have retired. Thank you. Um, Sarah's asked a really interesting question about the type of change that we might wanna make. And 
She just said, how do you decide if you need to make a small change or a big change in your life? Uh, I could take that much further, but I think it's just quite a, a lovely, simple question right there. Yeah, a small change or a big change. Uh, one thing I say at the top of the book, Stop Living on Autopilot, is that I'm a firm believer that you don't have to blow up your life to be happy. You don't have to get divorced. You don't have to move to Bali. You don't have to quit your job. You don't have to move to a new postal code. You can if you want. But typically, in my experience, when people make abrupt big changes, guess what? Whatever challenges or problems you had, they're really good at following you exactly <laughs> to wherever you go. I'm a big fan of making small changes. I'm, I'm a firm believer that breakthroughs come in small steps. It's like if you're going to cut down a tree, that first swing of an axe on a big tree doesn't do much. But with consistent swings, eventually the tree will fall down. Uh, one thing I don't want you to do is to go about doing this alone, thinking really, really hard, figuring things out. So what I'm going to challenge you to do is to find a group coaching program, to work with the coach. Um, you know better than I do if you think therapy would be something that you would benefit from. I mean, that could be an online course. Uh, but I'll tell you, if something has been on your mind for a really, really long time, that, that metaphorical tap on the shoulder, it, it is telling you that there's a decision to make. And not to get too deep, but I am a firm believer that the next steps in our life will not be revealed until we make a decision about our current situation. So we can manifest all we want, we can vision board all we want, we can journal all we want, all of those things are lovely and fantastic. And if we don't make a decision about our current situation, our next steps for the future will not be revealed. So what's that one small decision that you can make today? That, that, that's, that's what I can say, what's the one small decision you can make today? You remind me of a, a lovely quote, and I must confess, I can't remember who said it, but it was, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. And that to me feels so wise because it's like, you know, that's all we can ever do really in, in the moment. I agree. And, and someone just mentioned that things like coaching and therapy can be expensive. I agree 100%. Group coaching programs can be a lot cheaper, but guess what? We have amazing free podcasts out there that provide so much value. Amazing free audio books that you can get from your library amazing workshops, full workshops you can take on YouTube. All this is going to take is your time. At the end of Stop Living on Autopilot, excuse me, at the end of every chapter are powerful exercises, four questions at the end of each chapter that I've used during my coaching practice over the past 10 years. Unfortunately, when people read books, they skip the exercises, <laughs> the work where the magic actually happens. So yes, it can be expensive, but there are amazing free resources. And as Mark mentioned, there's an amazing app available for this community as well. Yeah, thank you. And there's also our free 10-day program at 10daysofhappiness.org. A, a couple of people have um, just asked what that quote was. It was apparently Arthur Ashe. And just to repeat it, because someone asked, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. Um, I want to come to something Catherine has asked about that day one energy. Lots of us, I think, especially in modern life, have that sort of feeling of overwhelm. And she's just asked, how can you bring day one energy to everything without being exhausted? Yeah, well, I wouldn't say you should bring it to everything. It should be those essential things. So first you have to identify what's most essential in your life and where you want to, to bring it. It makes me think about uh, this interview I read in 2016 in the New York Times, and they were interviewing two business owners that started a business in New York City in the 1990s. And at one point, the business owner is reminiscing about New York City in the 1990s. And he said something to the tune of, oh, wow, I really miss the old New York. But his business partner corrected him. He said, you don't miss the old New York. What you miss is the old you. Who you were during that time, how you showed up, that excitement, that vigor, that joy that you once had. So as, as you asked that question, it made me think about that. And I think we can find some cool things when we go back to the certain old versions of ourselves. I can still remember moving to New York City with less than $1,000 in my bank account with years of, with, with dreams of breaking into the television industry. And it took three years to get my big break in television. 
that led to a 10 year career. But I got to tell you, during those three years of struggle, I was bold, I was courageous, woke up with excitement and it was challenging, but I had a clear meaning and purpose behind what I was going after. So long, this, that was long winded, but you can't give your all to everything. I invite you to identify what those key things are, those essential things and give your most there. Mm. Sonia has asked a really interesting question, which I think is to do with how we sometimes have sort of social expectations and conditioning about you know, how we should be living our lives. And maybe that relates to autopilot. In her case here, she said, do you think the desire to have children is also part of the whole autopilot thing? So how can we know if something's like authentic to us or something that we're kind of just doing because it seems to be the expectation, if you like? That's a great question. You know, here in the United States, I can say that many of us, you know, we've been told we want to achieve the quote unquote American dream, you know, where you get your education, you get the good job everybody talks about, you get the house, you get married, you have kids, you get the minivan. And what's fascinating is when you really deconstruct that, all of that's rooted in what? In consumerism in many ways, right? Spending money, getting connected to the banks, et cetera. Uh, I invite you to do a deep dive for yourself personally. And I have an exercise in the book that takes a little bit lo too long for us to do right now, but there's a chapter that's actually called, What Do You Want? And it goes through some amazing exercises of how to identify, do you truly want something or not? Uh, and it has the exact specific steps to take. So I think you could do that as it relates to kids uh, and other subjects as well. Of course, having kids is an extremely personal decision. You know, my wife and I have five-year-old twins now. It's something that I've always wanted and I'm really excited. I also have friends here in Los Angeles and beyond who have no interest whatsoever in having kids. Uh, society is really good. Family members are really good, especially as we get older and trying to make us feel guilty for not doing certain things. Uh, but what I want to say here is that, um, again, just... It, it, just because you're going your own way doesn't mean it's the wrong way. So remember that just because you're going your own way does not mean it's the wrong way, even though society and people may give you their opinions or their projections on you. So I have some grace for yourself with that. I really love that. Just because you're going your own way doesn't mean it's the wrong way. Um, Sarah's asking a question which brings you back to the reference we were making earlier to the pandemic and the impact it may have had potentially in a positive way as well as all the, the suffering. She says, has the pandemic changed our value in presenting ourselves as perfect? Can it be more socially acceptable now to ditch the mask, come as we are and be sort of real from now on so no one feels alone in their struggles? What do you think? Yeah, I think a lot of people we shed a skin like a snake over the course of this pandemic. You know, in the book, I talk a lot about the uniforms that we wear in society. And these uniforms over time can get extremely heavy. Uh, so I'm all for being authentic. I'm all for being vulnerable, sharing the real versions of ourselves. I do want to add that, you know, I think we have to be careful with you know, we're with vulnerability, a lot of people, we love to share our story with everyone. I'm a firm believer that not, that not everyone deserves to hear your story. I'm a firm believer that, never, that we don't have to show our vulnerability to everyone, uh, to strangers, uh, to the people that matter most. Yeah, they're going to get me. But if I don't know you well, you, you may not get all of me. I mean, a quick example is, you know, in social media, uh, I have a decent following. But one thing my wife and I, we don't do is we don't show photos of our kids. And I have no problem with people who do show photos of their kids, that's fine. I've chosen not to do that because I've never felt comfortable with strangers like getting in, that inside of a look to my life. I'm old enough when this, when this grows, I have a lot of gray hair in here, but I'm old enough to remember when you would go to someone's home and if things you know, got personal, they, they may go back to another room and pull out a, a photo album that is really sticky. And it felt really special when they pulled out that photo album. It was like an intimate look into their lives. And so for me, photos of my kids are the exact same thing. So to sum that up, not everyone deserves your story to hear it or your vulnerability or authenticity, but how lucky are those folks who do get to see it? I think that's so wise. I think we've got this, and now you know, the kind of fake 
uh, showreels we see on social media. And then we've got this quest for vulnerability and openness. And, you know, actually what you're talking about is a sort of healthy balance in between, which is to, to, to share that openness, but in, in safe spaces and with people that we really trying to connect with. That's really wise. Um, Judy's yeah. asked a question, uh, which in short is just, can fear keep you in autopilot? She then gives an example about wanting to meet someone, uh, but is worried about the process of internet dating and you know how love works when you're feeling scared about new relationships and so on. But can fear keep you in autopilot? A hundred percent. I think you know there's good fear and there's bad fear. For, for me, well, I, I don't want to make make that sound like it's a judgment of fear. I know fear all too well, but I think it's good fear and bad fear. In my experience, good fear propels me forward. It's an opportunity to be courageous and, and bad fear keeps me standing still. Someone else also mentioned in the comments, you know, the challenge with being able to trust people. I think the quote is attributed to Mark Twain. It says, how do you know if you can trust someone? By trusting them, right? That's the only way. Uh, so maybe you don't go all in right away, but the question is a coach told me a long time ago because I had a lot of fears of opening up and being in committed relationships. I'm a guy that's married today, but for a long time, I'd get in a relationship. And right when things got really, really, really good, that's when I would leave. Because I thought that's when the rug was gonna be pulled from underneath me. Oh, this is going great. She loves me. Bye, see you later. <laughs> You're not gonna hurt me because of fear. Uh, but thank goodness through therapy, through work, I learned to pull back on my fear each day. Like, what's that millimeter you can open up a little bit more today? Maybe not the whole book, but what's that one page you can turn today to open up a little bit more? I think sometimes we try to do too much too soon. So if you are feeling fear, I invite you, what's that millimeter you can open up a little bit more today? And again, we can create that momentum as we move forward, the more we open up. Mm. Earlier on, you mentioned imposter syndrome. I guess that's that feeling of, I suspect most of us have experienced at times of just feeling like we're out of our depth. We're not really worthy of being in whatever situation we're in. And Amy's asked, how can you avoid, well, she said, how do you feeding imposter syndrome? I'm not sure if she means feeding as in growing or feeling imposter syndrome, but she was reflecting on the fact that some of the questions you were asking earlier were making her sort of doubt her value and her contribution. How, how do we relate to this imposter syndrome? Yeah, imposter syndrome is 100% real. I felt that over the course of my life. Uh, I think a quick example is for graduate skill, school here in the United States, uh, I went to Columbia University, which is a very esteemed, well-regarded Ivy League institution. Uh, growing up, I didn't even know what an Ivy League institution was. And I remember when I got on campus at Columbia University, I remember feeling very insecure and I remember feeling like an imposter. And I noticed right away there was a difference between the people that were on that campus and me. Uh, the vast, I, I had this feeling of, of hoping to be there. I felt like I hope this works out. I hope this is okay. Whereas I felt like a lot of folks that were there expected to be there in a way. There was a different mindset. Whereas I grew up hoping things would happen, a lot of people uh, grew up expecting things would happen. Now, to be clear, when I talk about expecting, I'm not necessarily talking about entitlement because we all know entitlement can be an ugly thing. But I've learned over the course of my life with imposter syndrome, the more I do the work, et cetera, the more I build up my confidence. So I learned over the course of time at Columbia University that those folks didn't necessarily have anything on me, that I was capable, that I could do the work. Um, as a speaker, I find that when, you know, at times I get in front of stages of 5,000 plus people, sometimes it's just 80 people, it depends. The only time I've ever, I feel like an imposter as a speaker, guess what, is when I'm not prepared. That's when I feel like I'm an imposter, when I'm not prepared. So I'm a firm believer that if you're doing the work, if you're working hard, you're doing all those things, if you're showing up every single day, even when people aren't seeing what you're doing, you know, imposter syndrome can be something we can embrace, we can love, we can talk to it, we can say, hey, I, I see you're showing up right now, but guess what? I'm worthy, I'm loved, I've done the work, I can be here, I can do this. So I just encourage you to keep doing the work while, while no one is watching and good things can come from that. But don't try to, I'm, I'm not a firm believer, I'm not, I don't necessarily try to fake it until you make it. If I'm feeling a certain way, 
I acknowledge it. I'll say it out loud. I'll, I'll talk to it. I'll give it a name. I'll give it a persona. So I know when it shows up and I can talk to it and say, hey, I'm going to make a shift right now. Thank you for showing up, Imposter Tony. But the guy who put in eight hours of work right now is about to go make some, make some magic happen. <laughs> Nicely put. Um, in a moment, I want to turn to just um, you sharing some of the resources and things that people can follow up with after today's event and, and share a couple of final thoughts. But um, one last question. Kadar's asked a really interesting point. Um, could you please talk about how to live a life of realism and optimism at the same time? You know, sometimes being too optimistic can hit us hard. And of course, the reality of our lives may be a little bit different. You know, things don't go to plan. How can we be a, a realistic optimist? You know, that's a tough question. You know, one of the funny things that happens whenever I speak internationally, particularly in Western Europe, they're like, you're so American. You're so optimistic. You think the sun's going to come out every single day, don't you? And I said, yeah, actually, I do. Uh, but uh, actually, I don't. Uh, believe me, I've experienced some challenging times and, and some real times. Uh, call me naive, uh, but I'm a firm believer that because we woke up today that the best thing to ever to happen to us has not happened yet. That's, that, that's just what I've, I've come to believe that because I woke up today, because my feet hit the ground, that the best thing to happen to me hasn't happened yet. And I believe that when we wake up like that every single day, things begin to change. But here's the key part of that about being real with the optimism. Not only am I gonna wake up and believe that the best is ahead, but I'm also going to work like the best is ahead. Typically, I think in society, if you just go to social media and Instagram, you're gonna see all these quotes, these beautiful quotes, but unfortunately there's no action behind them. So I invite everyone that I work with to not only believe like the best is ahead, but to also work like the best is ahead. And for me, that the work is the realism part of it. Uh, there's this great quote by the American bodybuilder, a former Mr. Olympia bodybuilding champ. And he says, I'm going to paraphrase to not you know, say any bad language, but he says, everybody wants big muscles, but nobody wants to lift the heavy weights. And so what I'm going to invite all of us to do to keep it real is to be willing to lift the weights. It's not just the vanity aspect of things. Uh, you know, nobody wakes up thinking about me. I've come to accept that. I realize that in the work that I do, it's my job every single day, especially as a speaker, as an author, et cetera, that I have to reintroduce myself to people every single day, letting them know the work that I do, the books that I have available, et cetera. So yeah, show up with that optimism, but also behind the scenes, be willing to do the work as well. And that keeps me humble uh, as can be. Mm. This has been such a helpful and inspiring conversation, Antonio. So grateful. I believe you have, well, in fact, tomorrow we're going to send out a link to everyone who's been part of this with a link to the video, a link to the chat file if you want to follow up on all the great helpful things that have come up in the chat, a link to your website and your book and so on. But you've got, I think you've got a free handout people can access. Do you want to say a bit about that? Yeah, if you go to my website, theantonionevs.com, theantonionevs.com, you'll see a link up top where you can get the the Stop Living on Autopilot Manifesto, uh, 15 key lessons from my book, absolutely no charge to you. You'll receive that link also tomorrow in the email. So everything central for me is the Antonio Neves. All the resources and tools can be found there. One day, that guy in Brazil is going to forget to renew AntonioNeves.com, and I'm going to get it. But until then, <laughs> it's the AntonioNeves.com. Uh. Um, I wanted to say a big thank you to everyone in the audience here this evening, especially all of you who made a small donation, or, but a very meaningful donation to support our charity nonprofit work to allow these and many other activities to carry on. Thank you. If you'd like to do something similar, if you've benefited from this event, please do use the link again in the email tomorrow to make your contribution. But above all, a massive thank you, Antonio, to you. It's been uh, a real joy to spend time with you this evening. I, I personally feel like I've learned a lot and I can see so much love for you and what you've shared in the community as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. What a joy. Is there, is there a final thought you'd like to leave us with? Yeah, you know, my final thought, I'll tell this fast. Years ago when I was on television, I was reporting a story in Alaska. 
If you know anything about Juneau, Alaska, it rains all the time there. But when I was there, I noticed that no one was using an umbrella outside. It was raining, but no one was using an umbrella. So I went up to a guy and I said, hey, I'm not from here. And he said, I know. And I said, but I noticed that no one here is using an umbrella. Why is that? And he looked at me through these beaded water glasses and he said, you know, man, it's just water. It's just water. And that hit me literally, it hit me as existentially, it hit me philosophically. I can't promise you that everything is going to go great in your life. But if you look at it, it's just water. That's going to build up that character. It's going to build up that grit. It's going to build up that resilience to help you move forward. But here's the key thing. When we get hit with that water, like life likes to hit us with that water, it's our responsibility to go find the sunshine to dry ourselves off. So never forget, it's just water. Lovely way to finish. And I'm just looking at the chat and seeing the words. Thank you, Antonio. This is exactly what I needed today. I feel the same. Uh, and from all of us, a huge thanks. Keep up the inspiring work and look forward to staying in touch. Thanks, everyone. Take care of yourselves.